Hello, welcome back to my channel. So today is part two of talking about my scoliosis story. I'm sorry if there's any background noise or anything, the road seems to be a lot more noisier today. There's a lot more people out and about. You wouldn't think we were still quarantined. If you haven't seen my first video, I suggest you go and check it out. I'll leave a link up there and down in the description so you can go and check that one out first because that's like obviously the lead up to this one because in the first video I talk about how I found out I had scoliosis and how I thought there was something wrong and how I ended up getting diagnosed. I talk with my hands loads so I'm sorry if that annoys anyone. <laughs> get into it so where am I going to start today I ended the last video with me talking about my little physio kind of session where I got up and I started walking around which was really good so that meant that I could then go down and get my x-ray to see how everything looked now which I was really excited about so they wheeled me off down on my little wheelchair went down for my x-ray had my little gown on and everything. I managed to go in there and obviously stand for a couple of minutes while they took the x-ray pictures. And then this is how my spine looks now. This x-ray isn't the one that I had a couple of days later. This is actually about six weeks after. Obviously you can see it was a massive improvement and I'm really chuffed with what he managed to do because with how it looked before, I mean, I'll put a side by side here now so you can see them next to each other. And I'm sure you'll agree like it's a massive massive improvement even when you look at my ribs so obviously you know i said the one side was all squished up and then now they're all pretty even and looking pretty good so yeah really happy with how it turned out now after my x-ray was done it was time for me to have a shower try and have a shower so i went back up to my room nurse comes and we go into the bathroom, obviously it's like a whole wet room thing and there's a chair in there. She gets it all prepped and everything for me, puts the chair by the shower and everything, puts a little bar of soap there, a bar of soap. She told me to try and wash my hair and try and wash the rest of me, which is obviously really hard and then said, try not to get your back wet because obviously you've got loads of bandages and stuff. I was like, oh yeah, like how the fuck am I meant to do that? <laughs> Anyway, she goes out the room and she said if I need anything just to pull the red cord and she'd come back in and help me out, which I wasn't expecting to have to do, but basically I sit down on this chair, I've got the shower going and I literally get this soap in my hand. It's one of those little like hotel soaps, I'm holding it in my hand and it literally just, it just fucking flew off. And I was like, for fuck's sake, I ain't bending down to pick that up. I can barely do anything. So I had to pull the cord straight away. She comes back in and she's like, what is, <laughs> she's like, what's wrong? I'm like, I've dropped the soap already, duck. You're gonna, you're gonna have to just do it for me. So she ends up washing my hair for me and I managed to kind of do the rest, but my back did get really wet. There was no way with me sitting down just like that, that I wasn't gonna get all these dressings wet so that happened but after that I got myself dressed in some of my own clothes so I wasn't in a gown anymore I just had trackers and a t-shirt on and I was on my bed and then some woman comes to change my dressing because obviously it was soaking wet it had already leaked fucking blood everywhere all over the bed so I had to change my top again anyway and I had my sheets and everything changed on the bed at the same time which meant me like rolling over to one side pulling that side out rolling over to the other side and pulling that side out and doing the same to put it all back on which was a bit of a task <laughs> now fast forward to thursday you know i'm feeling pretty good now in myself really and just getting sick of being in there to be honest i knew that i was going to feel better if i was just at home but obviously you can't really go unless they tell you it's okay so yeah thursday came around and the like assistant surgeon came in to see how i was doing the one that was helping out obviously like the main guy and he came in and said you know is everything all okay and all that kind of stuff i was like yeah it's great you know i'm really happy with how it looks and you know i'm feeling pretty good i'm feeling a bit more mobile ish now i'm feeling a bit more better in myself and he goes to me oh you might be able to go home later and i'm thinking fucking hell yeah like really i says are you sure he was like yeah he was like everything seems to be going all right and doing okay and everything so i don't really see why not 
So obviously got my hopes up then, I'm excited. I'm going through all the day and this was the only day I actually ate anything. And it was tomato soup and it was actually, it was actually really fucking nice. <laughs> that was the only thing that I'd managed to eat while I was in there other than the toast obviously on the Monday night. So I ate my tomato soup with my bread roll and all that kind of shit. And uh, yeah, it came to visiting time when my mum was coming and I hadn't texted her anything to tell her, you know, like what the doctor had said. I just waited for her to come because I thought, well, they'll say it while I'm here. And obviously it was an only an hour's visit. So she came at seven, she comes in and straight away I said to her, they said I, sh I should be able to go home today. And she was like, what, really? And I was like, well, that's what the doctor said. She was like, oh, well, we'll see then. She says, we'll see, you know, how the visit goes and whatever. And anyway, it was getting to like near the end, it got to about, it had to be about five to eight or something like that and nothing has happened and I'm thinking shit I'm not going home I don't want to do another day <laughs> I said to my mum I said you're gonna have to go and ask somebody I says because if someone said I can go home I want to go home she goes out goes and asks one of the nurses on the little like ward reception desk thing and this woman's like oh I don't know I've not heard anything about that and I was like fuck's sake my mum says you know if she can go home you know can we do that because she'd like you know she'd like that and that's what she'd rather you know i think she'd be better off at home now you know she's she's all all right and everything i think she she may as well go home and recover at home so this woman scurries off and goes to try and find out whether i can or not and she comes back and basically says that my prescription for my like liquid morphine's not ready to take with me because I'd already been, I'd been hooked up on a morphine machine thing for, I think since after I'd had it done. And it was next to me and I just had like a little button to press that was like every five minutes you could press it and get a morphine shot. And I hadn't actually used it that much. So the whole time I was in there, it had like a counter on it to see how many times you'd pressed it. And sometimes I just pressed it because I felt like I should be pressing it even though I didn't really feel like I needed it, which I don't really know. I was just kind of like, a bit unsure about it. I didn't really feel like, like it was painful, but it wasn't like, I don't know if I was sat doing nothing, which I was obviously most of the time, it, it didn't really hurt. It was only when you went to move, but I wouldn't have said, to me, it wasn't excruciating anyway. So I hadn't really pressed this morphine button a fat lot, to be honest. And I said that to her, I says, look, if you look at my morphine machine, I haven't really even pressed it. So you know, I'm not really bothered about taking it home with me. I'll just get some paracetamol or coconamol or something. And they were like, oh, okay. And she was like, well, I'll go and speak to somebody and we'll see what they say. So then she comes back luckily. And she says, yeah, you can go. She says the prescription will probably be ready like tomorrow or in the next couple of days if you, you know, if anyone wants to come back for it. And we said, oh, well, we'll see. You know, it says we'll go and pick up some coconamol on the way home. And then at least we've got that. But I was fucking buzzing. You know, I'd only been in there four days. So this was Thursday. And they said most of the time people are in there at least a week, if not two weeks, which I don't know. If you've had scoliosis, let me know down below how it was for you. But yeah, we went off, went to Tesco. This was a Tesco we didn't know. Mum goes in, tries to find Cocodamore, and she was ages. And obviously at this point I'd already, I'd been moving around a bit, so I was a bit uncomfortable and just sat in the car a bit uncomfortable. And she comes out, she was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry that it took so long. She was like, I couldn't find it anywhere. I was like, fucking whatever, get me home now. She pulls up at home. My brother's got a couple of friends around, so they get to watch me hobble out of the car and up to the house. Had to go up a couple of steps, managed to make that. Got into the house, luckily we lived in a bungalow, so no stairs, which was an absolute blessing. And I made it down to my bedroom, so I had to go all the way down like the corridor bit to get to the bedroom. I made it to my bedroom, and just as I got in there, I was like, shit, I'm gonna be sick. So I don't know where this superhuman power came from but I managed to sprint to the bathroom and made it to the toilet and I was actually sick in the toilet so I was pretty proud of that as well to be fair. Got myself in bed and then yeah just took it easy you know so I didn't really have any of the coconut either I had a couple maybe at the start of every day just to kind of you know feel good from the start but I wasn't doing a fat lot so there was nothing to really hurt you know like moving around and stuff. The pain for me wasn't wasn't that bad 
and it's definitely one of those things if, if I had to do it again I would do it again you know and then yeah I just chilled I just chilled at home for a couple of weeks obviously with it being May it had actually been really good weather for like a couple of weeks after my operation so I just spent the whole time sat outside on the sun lounger you know living the dream just chilling my mum washed my hair outside I'd like lay on the end of the sun lounger and she'd wash my hair and yeah it was it was it was pretty good you know there could have been worse ways to recover from an operation definitely but yeah then it got to about it got to a couple of weeks after and i started to feel you know all right we'd actually been out i'd been to tk maxx with my mom i remember that day that was my first outing and yeah i felt a bit weird and i wasn't going to try anything on or anything because i wasn't at that stage of like lifting my arms up and stuff but yeah i managed to you know go out for the day with my mom because i was 17 i'd only just turned 17 as well like in march so i just started learning to drive and i was so eager to drive because i lived in a little village in the middle of nowhere so though the buses were shit and there wasn't any way of getting out of there other than driving so yeah i really wanted to do my tests so obviously i'd started driving straight away when i was 17 like doing my lessons and everything and then this came up i was like fuck's sake this is gonna really put me back but i ring up my driving instructor and i says come on then let's get this show on the road and he was like oh, i'm going on holiday i'll be back next week so i had to wait another week so that was three weeks got on with that that was all sorted you know i passed my testing i think it ended up being like august because i did fail the first time on Friday the 13th of July <laughs> which was shit <laughs> and I pretty much just kind of carried on like I say I ended up because it was only a couple of weeks I managed to go back to college and just finish everything off get that all sorted and yeah I was really happy with how my recovery was going I went for my six weeks checkup which is where I got that x-ray from that I showed you before and one thing that was weird about that day when we went was they said oh have you been wearing your brace and I was like what brace? Which was like, oh, you were meant to go home with one, like when you left. And I was like, oh. Either way, we ended up spending like another fucking two hours there on this day. It was only meant to be like a checkup, getting a fucking brace and everything made. I was thinking, it's been six weeks now. I'm not wearing a brace now. And it was literally, it was this massive thing. I'll try and find a picture of one. But it was literally like a whole thing with. You know, like, it was like body armour, basically. You know, like motocross body armour, so you've got your front panel and your back panel. It was literally like that. It went over my head, but it was the whole thing, and it was formed to the whole of my body, all the way down to, like, my hips, legs. That was so uncomfortable, so I didn't wear that. The way it was cast on to me was how I was on that day, so I don't know. I don't think I'm any different now to that day, so I don't think it would have helped, really. Anyway, a few months went by after the operation and my dad actually ended up selling my enduro bike, which was a really sad day. He didn't tell me and then this man turned up and went home with my bike. I had a 2010 KTM EXCF 250 Champions Edition and I loved it and I know why he did it. You know, he got rid of it because he was scared that I was just going to jump back on it, which I was never going to do. You know, I was only going to do it when I felt ready and if I felt ready. So never mind. He, he said it was because it was sat there and it may as well just get sold. I do agree with him in some in some aspects, but it was still sad at the same time. But anyway, fast forward to actually getting back on a bike was when we went to the mini bike champs in Benidorm at the Finistrat track, I think it's called. Um, that was February 2014. Storm was doing the mini bikes and everything by then. I'd wanted to get back on a bike for a while, but I was just unsure of what kind of direction to go because I didn't really want to jump straight back onto an enduro bike or motocross or whatever because because of how rough it is really, you know. I wanted to get back into something that was probably a little bit more leisurely-ish, you know. And with the mini bike, it's on a tarmac track, so there's no bumps, rocks, poles other than a couple of fucking potholes but you know generally it's pretty smooth and easy going so i said to my dad on this one day while we were at a calf i said um do you think i could have a go at this mini bike thing and he was like yeah i don't see why not if you want to come and have a go then you know you can use one of storm's bikes and see how you get on 
And I was surprised he said yeah, to be honest, but I think he'd realised I was taking like a, a safer option. And I think he was happy about that. So yeah, 30th of March, 2014, rolled up at Stretton for my first ever go. I borrowed Storm CRF 150 and went out in the kids class because I was too scared to go out with the adults. And I was fucking shit, but I loved it. You know, I got back on a bike. I couldn't believe it. I was actually riding a motorbike again. It was only, you know, up from here. I ended up meeting Connor at the mini bikes and we've been together ever since. I ended up doing that for the rest of that year and I got my own CRF 150 and was loving doing that. And then I wanted to get back into the enduro again or at least a motocross bike and go into practice tracks and that kind of thing. Connor had got himself a motocross bike, so I'd been going to the tracks, but I was too, I was too scared to kind of, you know, just hop on his or whatever. Anyway, we went to Uncle Eddie's, which as you'll know from my other videos, it's a bit of a wild place, but it's pretty good if you're trying to get back into riding or if you've never ridden before because the track's pretty tame you know there's nothing that's gonna jump out at you other than a, a digger on track maybe sometimes but yeah the actual track itself is pretty tame and easy to ride so it's easy to get back into so i ended up going there my mum and my dad and my brother were coming so i was borrowing my brother's bike yeah went out and and that was it, got back on a bike and got back into it. I ended up borrowing Storm's bike now and then for a couple of times, like afterwards. And then my dad actually bought me another motocross bike for Christmas that year, which was dead nice of him. And just went from there and then ended up getting back into Enduro eventually, because Connor wanted to have a go, he'd never been and done it. So I says, come on, you know, let's go, I'm raring. And then we've just been doing what we've been doing basically. So we've done a bit of everything since then, which has been fun. But yeah, when I asked my surgeon about getting back on a bike kind of I don't know it must have been about a year after my operation like seriously asking him he was like well your back is technically stronger than anyone else's so you know you should be fine but you don't really know what knowledge a surgeon has of motocross or riding bikes or anything like that but I suppose you know he is right it's just that if something was to go wrong then it could go really wrong you know um I have heard of people that have had you know screws come back out and they've had to re-operate to have it sorted. I just worry that if a screw came out, what damage would it do to everything else? But you can't really live life like that, you know? So this is where my finale is. And it's basically, if you've been through any kind of operation and you know, you're scared of even getting on a bike to begin with, you know, you've always wanted to, but you've been too scared to because of what's happened to you, you know, we can't live life in fear of what's gonna happen. And I'm saying this now, and I don't even abide by my own rules. You know, I still get scared when I'm riding. Of course I do. I think that's just with getting a bit older as well, though I've just got a bit more nervous in general. I have good days and bad days on the bike. You know, it is what it is. I try and make most of them good days and I try not to think about it because there's no point, you know, I'm. I'm very much a believer if something's gonna happen it's gonna happen you could hurt yourself or get hit by a car while you're crossing the road you know I'm not gonna worry about hurting myself when I'm doing something that I enjoy doing I obviously don't want to break any bones or anything in general you know that's shit anyway but if you're gonna be scared you may as well just stay at home and just do fuck all because it's a big world out there and there's a lot of things that are gonna get you so going out and riding your bike if you enjoy it there is obviously higher risk of doing motorbike activities obviously but if most of the time you go out and you don't hurt yourself, then touch wood, you know, you're probably gonna be all right. Usually you end up falling off because you've made yourself so scared that you end up falling off. So if you try and ride positively, think positively, just enjoy what you're doing. You know, it doesn't matter if you're going slow, it doesn't matter what kind of speed you're going. We just gotta do what we gotta do. Here's some clips of like how my body looks now. Um, and how my scar looks now, obviously you get to see that as well. So I'll give you a bit of a 360. Obviously I do still have a bit of a, a lean to the left slightly. Like when I stand up straight, I'm still not straight, but I'm just happy that all the internals are way better. And my right sticky outy ribs are a lot better than they were, you know. I still have the whole thing of like when you stand up against the wall, one shoulder touches first and then the other shoulder blade touches, but it was never gonna be perfect, you know? Like you can only do as much as you can do and it's a lot better than it was. And I know that it's not gonna get worse. So I'm happy about that. That is the end of my story. If there's any questions or anything, just drop them down below and I'll get back to you. And I hope you've enjoyed this somehow and you can take 
something away from this. I don't even think about my back anymore. I don't really even think about it. It's just something that I've been through. Like I say, I just hope this can help somebody else that's going through the same thing or going to be going through the same thing. Just to know that, you know, you're not alone. There are other people out there. It's just life and it's just the card you've been dealt with. So the best thing you can do is just get on with it and just live every day like it's your last or try to. Hopefully we'll be allowed to go and rip some bikes soon. Need to get out on the bike, man. And I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.